This is Neef Talks. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the hardest working MC in the cosmos, Vincent Coolahan. <laughs> hey, welcome everybody. Welcome. Well, I hope everybody's had a really good day today back at Neef 2023. I hope you had. And we are, we are ecstatic that you are all here today. So for our keynote speakers today, we are very fortunate to have this inspirational and inspired person to be with us. She's a retired colonel from the United States Air Force, the first female to pilot a space shuttle, STS-63, and the first female to command a space shuttle at STS-93. She also commanded STS-114. With her today, we have the co-author, uh, co-authored the book, Through the Glass Ceiling to the Stars. Also, he co-authored the book, Bringing Columbia Home. Will you please give a big round of applause welcoming to Neef 2023, Colonel Eileen Collins and Jonathan Ward. Thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you, you guys. Well, good afternoon. Thanks for coming out today and enduring the, uh, the heat. Uh, we may do a strip show here up on stage here during the course of the... Uh, <laughs> it's great to be here today. Uh, Eileen and I uh, had the, uh, the great pleasure of working together on, on Eileen's memoirs, Through the Glass Ceiling to the Stars. And we wrote it for a very general audience. And I thought there were so many cool conversations we had during the course of, of uh, writing the book about some really interesting technical kinds of things about what it's actually like to fly with orbital mechanics and what it's like to look at the stars from on board the space shuttle. And I thought this would be a perfect audience to hear some of the behind the scenes kind of things. So I'm really happy to be able to share those with you today. Yeah, it's really great for me to be here also and thank all of you for coming out. I would have to say that the most amazing adventure that's taking place today is space exploration on many different levels. And what I'm doing now, with, along with Jonathan, is trying to share that great uh, message with people around the country and around the world of all ages, especially young people, because we want them to know the importance of reading. So we wrote a book. A lot of the young people, I have two kids. They're on social media, which is fine. But we want them to also be reading books. So we wrote the book. It's very easily readable for all ages. It talks about the history of I want to say uh, space flight in the space shuttle program, but also what I did in my career and how I got from you know, being a young person that grew up in a small town in upstate New York to the space shuttle program. So we're gonna start with, uh, we've got a little slideshow here, and I wanna thank Jonathan for all the hard work that he put into it, but we're gonna start, let's go to the next slide, with uh, one of the missions that I flew. So I flew four missions on the space shuttle, and my, my first and second missions were to the Russian space station Mir, which I talk more about in the book. But uh, here today, for this audience in particular, we're going to start with my third mission. I was commander on the flight. I was also, throughout my life, kind of an amateur astronomer. I don't quite have the equipment that Jonathan does to you know, go out and take those great uh, photos. But when I moved from upstate New York to Oklahoma back in 1978 to join the Air Force, I could not believe how beautiful the night sky was. In Elmira, New York, I lived in a little valley and it was cloudy quite often. I could see the stars, but once I moved to Oklahoma, I could not believe, I could see the Milky Way uh, from my own backyard, which was up against a wheat field. And I loved astronomy so much, I joined Astronomy Book Club and back then they had the magazines. I mm -hmm. subscribed to Astronomy Magazine and I just couldn't learn enough. I actually have a bookshelf of books that are all out of date because they were written in the 1970s. But, um, but anyway, so after my second mission, I wanted, I saw in the manifest this was called AXAF, A-X-A-F, Advanced X-ray Astronomy Facility. And it was about the point that I was going to be flying next. So I 
It's not really proper for an astronaut to go to their boss and ask to be on a mission, but I wanted that mission so bad, I just was, well, what can he say, no? So I went down and I asked him, uh, or told him I was interested in this mission if it worked out, and sure enough, I was assigned to the flight. Uh, they, named, they changed the name from AXAF to Chandra, uh, after uh, Chandra Sekar, who was a ast astrophysicist from the University of Chicago. And my crew was named. I'm just going to briefly introduce them to you. Uh, my pilot was Jeff Ashby, who's in the middle there. He's a Navy F-14 pilot who became an astronaut in 1995. This was his first flight. And then I had Steve Hawley, uh, who was my, they call it MS-2, but that's the flight engineer. And Steve was in the first class of astronauts back in 1978. He also is an astronomer, and that was one of the reasons NASA wanted him on that mission, because they wanted somebody who was able to communicate what we were doing and frankly answer the questions that I'm not able to answer to the astronomy community. We also had our uh, MS-1, which is Katie Coleman, and she's uh, standing next to me there. So Katie uh, was an Air Force colonel, and she uh, came to NASA in the class of 1992. This was her second flight. And down at the bottom there, we have Michelle Tanini, who came from the European Space Agency and he had flown once prior on the Russian space station Mir. So that was my crew, and we're, the patch over there in the lower left is, uh, was designed by the crew, uh, along with a, uh, we had a lot of artists that liked to help us with, uh, to put a little professional touch on it. And you can see the engine itself, the sheer size of one of the three main engines that burn the liquid oxygen and hydrogen that take us to orbit. You know, it, it, it was kind of prescient that they were standing in the engines because you're going to get to see some interesting behind the scenes of what happened with uh, the, the launch of Chandra. Uh, the first launch attempt uh, ended uh, in a, well, actually, well, let me talk a little bit about Chandra. First of all, Chandra was an X-ray observatory. This is Chandra being loaded into the payload bay of the space shuttle. It was about a 17,000 pound X-ray observatory and it's attached to an inertial upper stage, which is a rocket engine, which was propelling Chandra into an orbit that the lowest point, the closest point to Earth is about 8,000 miles, and the farthest point in its orbit is, is about a third of the way to the moon. So once Space Shuttle launched Chandra, there was no getting it back again. It had to work perfectly from the moment that it was launched. So there was a lot of pressure on Eileen to take this $2 billion prize into orbit and make sure that it worked properly. Okay, next slide. Okay. So this is uh, going to uh, be... Can we have the video for this one, please? This is going to be a view of the crew doing uh, some of the training for the mission. So you see Katie Coleman in the foreground there. She's suiting up for uh, training in the NBL, which is the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. Now, the Chandra itself did not have any contingency EVAs, meaning there was nothing there that could break that the astronauts could fix the way it was designed. But what we did have was five contingency EVAs on the inertial upper stage. And so Katie and Michelle trained for that. Fortunately, nothing broke and we didn't have to do that, but they still had to be prepared. So these are some of the scenes from their training uh, in the NBL at Johnson Space Center. So if something went wrong with the engine, uh, they could try to repair it, but if something went wrong with the telescope, you had to bring it back. You couldn't just park it in Earth orbit and bring it back. Right, so during the training as well as uh, the first day of the mission, we had a mission control team out in Sunnyvale, California, that was the IUS, the Inertial Upper Stage Operators. So they would be sending commands up to the IUS and testing it out. We did some of the commands on board, but most of them were sent from Sunnyvale. And then there was also the Chandra, um, I want to say the Chandra Operations Center, which at the time was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and they were sending commands testing out the Chandra, and all three teams, along with Mission Control in Houston, were doing this uh, testing and coordination that we had done over and over and over again for over a year in the simulator. And it, in the simulator, numerous things broke. But on the actual flight, perfect. Yeah. We anything, almost thought yeah. we wasted all that time in training, but we were ready for anything. If anything had gone wrong with Chandra and they had to come back, this was the heaviest payload that the space shuttle ever took into orbit, and so there was a lot of uh, questions as to whether the space shuttle was going to be able to, re, uh, to survive a hard landing if you had to come back and make an emergency landing with, uh, with Chandra on board. So with that backdrop set here, the, this is the first launch attempt 
of the, uh, the space shuttle of, of STS-93. And if we can have the video for this one, please. Uh, this was a... T uh, minus 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7. Cut off is given. CTD to CTD, but it's just, we have uh, uh, hydrogen in the aft at 640 ppm. I right, copy, and C prop NCD. We have a cutoff of our sequence. Yeah, decreasing now. And did this C prop, uh, we see the spike. Okay, any uh, emergency securing? Uh, negative, sir, everything's coming down. I right, copy, and SPE NCD. Go ahead. Okay, uh, RSLS or GLS hold? There was a cutoff command given four tenths of a second before the space shuttle's engines ignited. Had the engines ignited, they would have had to take Columbia off the launch pad and completely replace the engines and bring them back again. So this, that was a cutoff because of a, a, of a what turned out to be a uh, erroneous indication of a hydrogen leak in the uh, aft engine compartment. And one thing, the crew on board, and you didn't hear my voice there, that were, those were the, you heard RSLS uh, cut off, those were the voices coming from the LCC, the Launch Control Center. There was actually an engineer that manually pushed, he saw the hydrogen spike on his data in the F compartment, and he pushed a button to stop the launch, which took a lot of guts on his part. He did the right thing. They actually gave him an award for that. Um, but what was going on on board was, uh, we had to revert from we're getting ready to launch to we're doing a scrub and we might have to do an emergency evacuation out from the launch pad and we had slide wire baskets they're kind of like zip line that could take us away if there was going to be an explosion but we heard I think it was just a couple of minutes that they called that it was a sensor one other thing I should say if you notice uh, July 20th that was the 30th anniversary of the moon landing we had all kinds of people down to see the launch which didn't happen we had the three Apollo astronauts um, from Apollo 11 were there uh, the women's soccer team that had just won the World Cup and there were I won't go into all the people that were there but it, it turned out to be kind of a circus well, most of them went home, and then we went into the next launch yeah. attempt. The next launch attempt ended with, a, with thunderstorms nearby, and so you weren't able to go. And then there was finally the third launch attempt. And if we can have the video for uh, the third launch attempt. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. We have a go for engine start, zero. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Columbia, reaching new heights for women in X-ray astronomy. Columbia is in the roll. We've got a fuel cell pH number one. Roger roll, Columbia. We're looking at. Columbia used to be like AC bus sensors off. We're evaluating the fuel cell. Columbia. Roger that, Columbia. Looks like we had a transient on AC-1. Columbia is now headed downrange, altitude 3.8 3 uh, miles. And as we hear, uh, all systems uh, okay. It looks like a sensor on board. Three engines throttling down, all at 67%. Columbia, Houston, we are critical to AC-2 on the center engine. AC-3 on the right. We've lost DCU-A on the center and DCU-B on the right. So the public affairs okay. guy made a mistake. Columbia, go with Columbia, throttle up. Houston, you are go with throttle up. Columbia, go with throttle up. He said it was a, it was a sensor problem. Columbia, Houston, you are go with throttle up. He said it was a sensor problem on AC-1 phase A. It was not. It was a real, uh, it was a transient short. But because of that, we lost two main engine controllers. We lost the primary on the center engine and the backup on the right engine. Fortunately, there's redundancy in the shuttle, and on that center engine, the backup controller took over. If it didn't, we would have lost an engine, and we would have been turning around and bringing Chandra back to the Kennedy Space Center, which is something we did not want to do. That that is a maneuver that's never been flown before that's uh, highly risky. It's certified to work, but because Chandra was so heavy, and if you notice, the IUS was in the back. We had this aft center of gravity, which makes it a little more difficult to fly. It's a little more pitch sensitive with the aft center of gravity. We absolutely did not want to do that. But the entire time during the launch, I was thinking, 
We had that exact same malfunction that we trained for in the simulator the last practice run that we did before launch day. And then Jonathan's going to talk about, so that was the electrical failure. And I mentioned it was transient, so the, all the pumps, like our water pumps and our Freon pumps and our air pumps, winded down temporarily, and then they came back up to speed. With the AC power, you're able to get your pumps back, but you're not able to get your, uh, flight contro the, your engine controllers back. Yeah, and right at the same time that was happening, the booster officer in mission control was reading, and what turned out to be an erroneous reading, that they'd lost steering on the right-hand solid rocket booster, which could have caused the space shuttle to keel over and head towards the launch control center. So very, very hairy uh, situation going on. And um, uh, what, what, this is what turned out to be the issue. There was a, a screw that had been overly tightened, and there was a bird uh, a little bit of uh, metal on that that was rubbing against a wire in Columbia's payload bay. And uh, as a result of this, when, they, when, they, when Columbia came back again and they analyzed this, the entire space shuttle fleet had to stand down for five months while they inspected the wiring and all of the other orbiters. And then there was one other issue that the crew was unaware of as well. And this, let's have the video on this one. Yeah, so take a look uh, at the right engine there. And as, w as you see the liftoff, uh, you're going to see a streak of leaking hydrogen burning coming out of a spot. Um, it's it's the, the engine on the right side, but it's the left side of the engine bell. And as you lift off, and they, they notice this afterwards, you see that streak coming out of the engine? Uh, a, a, um, there's injector plates on these engines, and when those engines get old, they would, the uh, engineers, technicians would put pins in the particular hole that the hydrogen comes out of, and I won't go into all the reasons, safety reasons why they do that, but one of those pins popped out when the engine lit, hit the side of the engine bell and opened up three tubes. And because of that, we leaked hydrogen all the way up to orbit. The crew did not know about it. You know, we on board didn't have insight into that. Mission Control did. If you ever get a chance to pull it up on YouTube and listen to the Mission Control, it'll just, it'll water your eye, your ears, it'll water your ears, <laughs> listening to how professional these people were trying to diagnose the problem. Yeah, the combination of the, of the, of the leak, but then with those two engine controllers going down that actually made less sensitivity so the engines didn't <coughs> overcompensate and uh, there could have been the possibility of running out of liquid oxygen before the main engine shut down, which could have caused an explosion. And likewise, this is, uh, this is what the tubes look like when, they, when Columbia came back. Uh, that pin hit these cooling tubes, which are carrying liquid hydrogen to cool down the engine bell. If, uh, so these are, these are the three holes punctured by that pin. If two additional ones had been punctured near there, the engine would have burned through, and it would have been loss of crew and loss of the space shuttle. So this was the closest, I think, that NASA came to another Challenger-type accident on launch. Uh, so many things going wrong at the same time, but the right person in the, uh, in the commander's seat. Yeah, and if it really reminded us how risky space flight is. And throughout the shuttle program, we had to keep reminding ourselves, this, you know, this is still a test program. This is not operational. We're still learning not only how the space shuttle flies, but how it interacts with the environment. I think we can go to the next slide. Yeah, let's go to this. So um, this is, uh, if we can have the video for this one, this is the video of Chandra deploy. Okay, so we're, I, would, I think, maybe about six hours into the flight. Uh, we were, the crew was running a checklist, and Katie Coleman was uh, MS-1. She was in charge of running the operation and getting this uh, Chandra deployed while I was watching the space shuttle side of things. Now, this is the view that the astronauts had out the back window looking into the payload bay. You are seeing the very front end of Chandra. So if you can imagine the tilt table in the back of the payload bay, and which you'll see a view of it here in a minute, but we tilted the Chandra up to about 28 degrees, get the antennas clear, so as I mentioned earlier, the mission controls on the ground could run their checks. We're running checks on board, that's us looking out the back window, and then when everything checked out, we raised it back up to, I think it was 57 degrees, I don't remember the exact number. And so here is Chandra at the full deploy position, and Katie is gonna push the switch that will actually release uh, the hooks and the little spring will push Chandra out and it flew right overhead. Now, if you take a look, uh, Jonathan, show them on the, on the right side, oh, yeah. the payload bay oh, there right. window. Okay. So that's the crew up there looking out the window. This is a camera in the back of the shuttle. You can see the engine bell for the IUS and you, actually all you can see here is the inertial upper stage. Chandra is off the top of the view. 
but it flew very, very slowly right above our window. We were able to see it out the overhead window. I'm getting ready to fly a maneuver on uh, what was shuttle to, uh, Columbia to fly a maneuver to separate the shuttle from Chandra because it's just going to float away and in about an hour, the IOS burn is going to happen. It was interesting looking at how close the engine bell was to the back end. You said it was only like three or four inches from the back end. Once you tilt it up, yeah. it was six inches uh, yeah. clearance. So it was, a, it was a huge payload, larger than a school bus. And this is the last view that any uh, human had of Chandra. We, I believe we had to downlink this and send it down, send it down later. There's the view. You got uh, the Chandra on the left there, the IUS on the right. Our crew tried for months to get permission to see the IUS burn about an hour later, but the shuttle guys wouldn't let us watch the burn, which would have been beautiful. But they were afraid if it exploded, it would put debris on our windows. So we had to turn our uh, engines towards the uh, IUS in case there was a problem. We wouldn't have any damage on the shuttle. And there's sunset on Chandra. That uh, observatory was built for five years, and here it is, 23 years later, still going. Still going strong. So this was, uh, this was the first light image from Chandra, which came back in uh, August, about a month after the mission. And this is uh, Cassiopeia A, the supernova remnant. First time that we'd ever seen this uh, pulsar at the center of, of uh, Cassiopeia A. Uh, Eileen was very, very proud to see, uh, said that, uh, very proud to see that, that Chandra was working. And then here are some of the other beautiful images. Yeah, so once the crew came back, you know, we were busy writing reports, uh, doing debriefs. We had to go out and talk to the public. We made trips to all the, the mission control and all the people that supported the mission to thank them for what they did. Meanwhile, we're waiting for a first light to come back, and we're all nervous. You know, we felt like we were, we were part of the mission, too, because we followed AXAF, back when it was, before it was named Chandra, uh, from when it was built out there, it was built by TRW in Southern California, which TRW doesn't exist anymore, but those uh, people that built it were very, very proud of what they did, and we did not want a problem like Hubble to happen. That's part of the reason why, I mean, we learned a lot from the mistakes of Hubble. Hubble could be repaired, you can't repair Chandra. So all this end-to-end -end testing was done on the ground, to make sure that it was working perfectly. It caused delays to the launch time, but it was worth it because sometimes the delay, you no, know, nobody likes the delays, but the reason we had those delays fixed potential problems. And you can see, I'm not gonna go through all these images, but uh, Chandra has a website that you can go to. I encourage uh, people to do that and see uh, just some of the fantastic things that we're learning about the universe that we live in. For, for those of you who have imaged the Crab Nebula before, that's the dynamo at the center of the Crab Nebula as seen in X-ray light. Uh, Chandra also has been used in conjunction with other uh, space telescopes. This is a picture of Jupiter that was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, and then Chandra used X-rays to observe the auroras in Jupiter's atmosphere. And this is a, a picture I hadn't seen before until doing some research. This is uh, X-ray light being reflected off of Saturn. Uh, again, this is 30 hours worth of imaging from Chandra, so it gives you an idea of uh, the power of that telescope to pick up extremely faint signals. So, uh, as with all of these great observatories, NASA uses them in conjunction with each other. So, Chandra was done and deployed after day one, and then you had several more days on orbit to, uh, to conduct experiments. Yes, yeah, so we'll just briefly talk about some of the other experiments we took on board. We called these secondaries because, you know, our primary payload was Chandra, and 95% of, actually, 95% plus of our training was on Chandra. We're talking $2 billion, I don't really think you could put a price on it, telescope, we, that was the focus of our training. But now, we pulled out our secondary experiments, uh, because flight day one in Chandra went fine, and what you see here is Steve Hawley and Michelle Tanini, which were the uh, astronauts running the Swiss telescope, and SWIS stands for the Southwest Research Institute Ultraviolet uh, Imager. And if you look behind Steve, you are going to see a bunch of wires, and the side hatch of the space shuttle is where Steve mounted that ultraviolet telescope to view a variety of targets. That window 
does not have an ultraviolet filter on it. It is the only window on the shuttle that we could use for UV, uh, to observe in UV light. And there you can see the telescope. And let's go to the next slide sure. that Jonathan will talk yeah. about. There, there's the, the window. Yeah, so it, the, the telescope was, it was a specially modified Quest R 7 inch with an ultraviolet, uh, ultraviolently transparent uh, front corrector plate. But I, I love this image as an amateur astronomer just looking at the, I know how jerry-rigged my telescope is, and just to see what you had to do to hold the telescope in place there, and then there's a light cover over top of it. Yeah, a couple things to say about this. Um, uh, Jeff and I, who were flying the orbiter, had different attitudes to fly to. So if they wanted to image, for example, you know, Jupiter or one of the planets, we had a pre-uplink uh, to us what attitude we needed to fly to to have that side hatch aim at whatever their target was going to be. There's also no gravity, so it is, you can have a very heavy item on a bracket like that, and it's no big deal. It doesn't, doesn't keep falling down. It stays uh, extremely steady. As long as, like if the, en if the uh, shuttle's engines fire, you, it can jerk the telescope around a little bit, so we had to be careful for that. One last thing I wanted to say about that side hatch window, we had an astronaut, oh, it must have been five years before this, that went to that side hatch and he was looking out at the Earth out that window. Well, the sun was shining on his face and he came back with a massive burn on his face. I have never seen anybody have such a horrible, his face was blistering and he said to me, I was only in that window for maybe less than five minutes. And it just goes to show you how much our atmosphere here on Earth protects us from the damaging ultraviolet rays, you know, how damaging, damaging that is to our skin and our body. And, and how much the atmosphere protects us. We have an ultraviolet filter that we're supposed to put on that window anytime we're not using it for other things. If we could have uh, the next video, please. This is uh, some of the video that came back. What, uh, Alan Stern, who I know all of you are well familiar with as the investigator for New Horizons, he was the one that developed this telescope. And the idea was to look for volcanoids, uh, which were uh, hypothetical asteroids inside the orbit of Mercury. So he observed Venus. This is Jupiter in the light of ultraviolet, uh, one of the first images taken uh, of Jupiter in ultraviolet. And then also we'll have an image of the moon in ultraviolet, one of the first images of the moon. So this telescope was originally supposed to fly on three missions. And as far as I know, it only flew on two. I think the idea was that it was going to fly a spectroscopic uh, mission after this one. But uh, so they did get data back. They did not find any evidence of the volcanoid asteroids. No, they all wanted to become famous to discover something, but it, it didn't happen. But at least we tried. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit more about now some leading into other kinds of astronomy that you could do from on board. And this is a different mission now. This is uh, one of Eileen's most famous pictures and favorite pictures. So. Yeah, we're going to just jump back to my mission in 1997. It was STS-84, and I wanted to take a photo of hale -Bopp. So you remember Comet hale -Bopp? All right, so... I told my photo TV engineer, I want to take a photo of hale -Bopp and I want to send it to Astronomy Magazine and get published. And he's like, sounds great. <laughs> so we got, the, we got a procedure, we got the equipment, I won't go through the whole thing, but we had to put the shuttle in inertial attitude hold. To keep, you can see how the Earth is turning below us. I forgot what, ex, what how it was. It was like 14-second exposure. 14-second exposure. Uh, 14 exposure. 14 second exposure. So the Earth, eight seconds, you, I'm sorry, eight-second exposure. Eight seconds. Okay, yeah. when you can see the Earth's atmosphere there, the very high level of the atmosphere, and then, of course, hale -Bopp in the middle there. So I, I spent hours trying to get this photo. We got several, but that's the best one. So I come home, I get a hard copy of this, and I send it off to Astronomy Magazine. I subscribed, right? So like a week later, my astronomy magazine comes in the mail, and in there is a photo of hale -Bopp taken by STS-83 astronaut Don Thomas that was way better than mine. <laughs> because, because at this point in time, the comet was leaving the solar system, and it was, quite, it was a little bit dimmer than that. And I said, oh, they're all going to think I'm an idiot when they, get the, when they get the photo. But at least I can say I... And I also photographed a variety of, like, of astronomical objects, especially the moon, which was, which was a beautiful target. So over to Jonathan. For those of you keeping track at, at home, this is uh, Orion's head. There was Betelgeuse there, so uh, Orion upside down. So I was able to date the photograph by looking at where the comet was in the, relative to that. So this is, uh, this is jumping back to 83 again, but this is what, what the moon looks like uh, from space. And I wanted to ask, I, I asked Eileen, what does it look like 
you know, there was always this talk about why don't you see stars in the pictures from the moon. And I was asking her, can you see stars in the daytime from orbit? Or what can you see from inside the, the lighted uh, cockpit of the space shuttle? Yeah, and you can see stars from space. And, you know, we do take photos. Of course, if you're on the sh in the shadow of the Earth, on the dark side of the Earth, it's, it, you don't have all that light in the cockpit, so you can get a better photo. Even if you're on the daytime side of the Earth and the sun is shining on the orbiter, you can still see stars. It kind of depends on which way you're pointing. But you don't want to look at stars when you're, because what you can see from space is similar to what you can see from Earth. You don't have twinkling of stars because you don't have the atmosphere that causes the twinkle here on Earth. You'll have just the solid stars. But the Earth is so compelling, it's so beautiful. You know, the blue and the white and the bright deserts that if you have any time to look out the window, you want to look back at Earth. But of course, if there's something that's important to photograph, we, we turn towards that. We're going to, to jump to uh, Eileen's next mission. Yeah, I was going to just say something about this is a uh, poster that was made by the Space Flight Awareness Program. The photo was taken at the end of STS-93. You know, we had the successful Chandra deploy, and we landed back at Kennedy Space Center, and our families were there to greet us. So I, my daughter was three years old at the time, and we were getting back on the Gulf Stream 2 to fly back home to Houston, and one of the PIO people snapped this picture. A couple months later, I see these hundreds of posters coming out that say, are you ready for us to go? They never asked my permission, but that's okay. You know, it's, <laughs> um, but it was part of the, because we had had the problems that we had on Columbia, it, it I think reminded people that spaceflight is a risky, dangerous business. You can launch these telescopes on an expendable, you know, like we, we launched the uh, infrared telescope shortly after this on an expendable. But the thing about having people on board is if something breaks, you can go out and fix it. And back when the Gamma Ray Observatory was launched, I, I think it was 19, or the early 1990s, the high gain antenna would not deploy. So Jerry Ross went out on a spacewalk and all he did was shake that antenna and out it comes. So we would have lost all of that, you know, high rate data had we not had astronauts on board. I mean, they tell me they had a, low, a lower gain antenna, but they really wanted that high gain. So it is buying down your risk by having astronauts there. So, uh, but it, it was quite a bit of risk what we experienced on Columbia. So they ginned up this program and they got three astronauts and their kids uh, in these posters and they sent them around to all the offices around, not just NASA, but the contractors and reminded people uh, not that it was anyone's fault, but just remind people that we're not just sending payloads, but we're also sending people that have families. Yeah. You know, I, Eileen was, uh, had, had flown two missions to Mir, one that docked with Mir, and then the, what was going to be the last flight of her program, STS, of her career, STS-114, was scheduled to fly originally in 2002, got bumped to 2003. She was going to be the next mission after the Space Shuttle Columbia came back, just like five weeks after that came back. And of course, then there was the the Columbia accident on February 1st of 2003. And uh, the question was now, was Eileen going to retire from NASA or was she going to stay on with the program? Yeah, well, I decided after this flight that the future was, well, we all knew the future was the space station. The space shuttle was originally built with the purpose of building a space station in low Earth orbit, which would test out you know, our equipment and you know, astronauts living in space for long periods of time. I, w I felt that my importance to NASA, it would be more important to me for the rest of my career had I actually gone to the space station and been there myself. So I signed up for another flight. It was my fourth one, and I don't regret that a bit, but I thought what was going to take one year of training ended up being four years of training because of the accident we had in the interim. Yeah. And let's go to the next slide and we can uh, Take yeah. a look at this is the training for STS-114. Yeah, so uh, those of you who remember the Columbia accident, it was a piece of foam that came off of the external fuel tank and hit Columbia's wing. And the space shuttle fleet was required to stand down. We were under international treaty to, to complete the U.S. portion of the International Space Station by February of 2004. That obviously couldn't happen if the space shuttle was grounded. And so this was an opportunity to make not only those repairs to the external tank, but to make other repairs that were badly needed for safety of the space shuttle. Here the, uh, the crew is inspecting the booster separation motors that push the solid rocket boosters away. These did not 
always work as reliably as they, as they would have. There was an issue with the hold down posts that have uh, explosive bolts that fire as the space shuttle is lifting off. Those didn't always fire in sync like they were supposed to. Uh, they discovered in servicing space shuttle discovery that the rudder speed brake, brake actuator, which opened up the speed brake in the, uh, the tail, one of those actuators was installed backwards. And so commanding the thing to open would have caused it to close and could have caused an accident on the ground. So there were a number of things that Eileen and her crew had to feel very, very comfortable had been corrected. And these things made the space shuttle safer, but they never made the space shuttle completely safe. Next slide. Okay. So this, uh, can we have the video for this one? So finally, this is now July of 2005, yeah, and the launch of STS-114. It had been two and a half years since a shuttle had launched, and people were all around the world were just why you can see the uh, the purge down there at the bottom. You can see the water deluge at the bottom. And we don't have any sound here, but we're going through the countdown. Okay, these are the sparklers. Their purpose is to burn off any excess hydrogen that might be milling around in the area. There's the booster light and six. I'm sorry, the main engine light and six seconds later, the booster's light and liftoff. Now, one of the very different things about this launch is there were cameras everywhere. We had over 90 cameras around the launch site looking for any potential debris that might fall off and hit the heat shield on the shuttle. Okay, there's our roll program. So we're head, heading heads down, going into 51.7 degree inclination, making that turn. And the, the uh, Camera views were incredible. We even had cameras on board. If you look over there in the lower left, uh, you're gonna, that circle, I'm sorry, the lower right, you can see the shuttle's uh, tiles at the top, the fuel tank on the bottom. We also had uh, airplanes flying, imaging us with the best imaging possible. Yeah. There's the booster separation, which happened at two minutes. Those boosters, as you know, were reused. You know, the shuttle, the orbiter and the boosters were reused throughout the program. And one of the things I should say about this particular launch, you know, jo Jonathan mentioned it was a piece of foam that hit Columbia that caused the loss of Columbia and the death of seven astronauts. We thought we had fixed all that, but a piece of foam fell off on my launch that was seen in this massive amount of photography and film that we had. And so the shuttle was again uh, grounded for another year until they were able to, to fix those problems. Now I will say, the space shuttle was very expensive, it was very complicated. It was a rocket, it was a satellite, it was an airplane, extremely versatile. It was able to pretty much do everything. The problem with the shuttle, not only was it expensive, but it was so complicated and had so much risk in it, there was no ejection system once you lift off. Today's rockets have, we don't call them ejection system, we call crew escape system. But if there's an explosion with today's rockets, the, crew, the whole capsule can be uh, ejected off the top and come down safely in a parachute. And the other thing about today's uh, rockets is the heat shield, which brought down Columbia. Uh, you can see the shuttle's heat shield was exposed to falling debris. Well, today's rockets, the heat shield is protected um, all the way at the top. There's no way anything can hit it. So today's launch vehicles are much, much safer. And when we voted, when the astronaut office voted for what type of design do you want in future rockets? We all voted for, let's go back to what we had during Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, because that's much safer. One of the other uh, things that came about was the use of the, uh, potential use of the International Space Station as a safe haven if anything were to go wrong. And so there were a number of uh, ways that NASA devised to inspect the, the heat shield. One was an extra robot arm, and another one was um, uh, a rendezvous pitch around maneuver we'll talk a little bit about here, but the idea was that uh, from, from orbital mechanics standpoint, the space shuttle is coming up from an orbit below the space station, and maybe Eileen, you can talk a little bit about what it's like to fly this, this uh, approach to a station. Yeah, so the space station is in the origin of this, yeah. and of course so the, the Earth, space station. Yeah, the Earth is at the bottom, and we flew something called a V-bar approach, which meant we, so we, we, we came up from below, and I'm just going to pause for a minute at the, well, for several minutes at the minus 600 foot point where we did the RPM rendezvous pitch around maneuver, which we'll see here in a minute. And then I flew it up. By the way, the rendezvous in the shuttle program were all hand flown by the commander. Today they're automated. 
but we uh, flew them by hand back in those days, and then we uh, came in down the V-bar and docked. Flying in space is not as intuitive as flying an airplane. Flying an airplane, you just point at your, you know, your, whoever you're rejoining on, and you add power, and you go there. If you try to do that in space, what the Gemini astronauts realized, they pointed their Gemini at the Agena target, and they'd add power, and they would actually be doing a, what's called a posi-grade burn. So instead of going straight at the Agena, they would go up, and they'd see the Agena disappear below the nose. And like, what's going on there? So it, it's not really intuitive in the sense of flying an airplane. So what we've done today is we had, we had a laptop computer called RPOP, Rendezvous Prox Ops Program, and we use that to help us. Uh, we called them what ifs. Should I go in, out, right, left, up, down with my uh, little reaction control system jets? And that helped us save fuel and save time. Yeah. And I think we can go to the, I think is, yeah. is the next one the. Okay, we have the video for this one, please. This was the rendezvous pitch around maneuver. Sped up, it actually took six, six minutes, but it sped it up here. So, so this, yeah, yeah, if you want to talk about that. See, if yeah. you, uh, so the, the, the astronaut and cosmonaut on the space station, uh, Sergei Krikalov and John Phillips, photographed the shuttle. One of them was doing video and one was, uh, had, a, had a still camera with a long lens. I think it was a 16, I can't remember, but it was a long lens, and they were able to map. They had a plan on the actually where to take the pictures and map that. They were all digital, so they downloaded those photos to Mission Control, which actually saw that we did have some damage. Um, there were some gap fillers that popped out, and we won't go into the detail on that, but we did a spacewalk to remove those gap fillers and possibly had avoided having some tiles peel off while we came home. So this maneuver, the RPM rendezvous pitch around maneuver, was flown on every space shuttle flight after ours that was going to the space station. So Eileen became the first person to fly this. So you were saying that you flew it manually up to the point where this was starting 700 feet below the space station, get the maneuver started, and then the, the autopilot takes yeah, over? Yeah, so the hardest thing about this was flying to the 600-foot point because that was hand-flown, and we had to hit six degrees of freedom. The right, left, uh, in, out, up, down, as well as the what we call x dot, y dot, z dot, which is the velocity in those uh, different directions. And so all of so is really flying to that point. Once we got to that point and hit those targets, the maneuver itself was flown on autopilot. And then once we came out of the maneuver six minutes later, I took back uh, manual control and flew it up to the V-bar and into dock. Yeah. And it, it's a crew effort. You know, the, you can't really fly it. Well, you can, but if you want to do the best possible rendezvous and docking, you need your crew there helping you out with that. Yes, yeah, so you had peop people there with LIDAR and uh, handheld things like that in addition to the computers reading through. So a lot of data being fed to the commander as you're flying this mission. Okay. Okay, next. Okay, so this is a view of the International Space Station that was taken during that rendezvous pitch around maneuver. And you see the space station looks a lot different in 2005 than it does now. The, the space station was less than half of its size. We have uh, now four sets of these uh, solar panels that are deployed along the, uh, the space station. But it was thanks to being able to, uh, to fly the return to flight mission that NASA felt confident to be able to finish the International Space Station with continuing uh, space shuttle flights. The legacy of Columbia was that uh, the space shuttle was, was, uh, was, was de deigned as being too unsafe to con continue to fly after the International Space Station was completed. So there was only actually one other mission after the Columbia accident that did not fly to the International Space Station, and that was the final Hubble repair mission. But every, every other one went to the International Space Station. Okay, next slide. Okay. I think this might be close to our last one. So yeah. that was 2005, uh, the day after landing. Uh, that's my husband and kids, and you can see Jim Kelly back there with the sunglasses on. We called him Vegas, Vegas Kelly. And coming back from this mission, was just, I, I can hardly even describe how I felt, incredibly exhausted, both physically, mentally, emotionally. It had been four years of training for this flight, and we came back and landed at Edwards Air Force Base on, uh, after 15 days up there of doing this very high visibility mission, and now it's over. Uh, 
we worked at least 24 hours that last day, you know, getting up, getting ready to come home. We had all these weather wave offs. We ended up landing at Edwards Air Force Base. And when I well, talk for just a minute about how an astronaut feels when they come home, when I got off the shuttle, for some reason, I felt very, very bad. My first three missions, I was like, be able to hop off the shuttle, you know, be bopping around with no problems and lots of energy. But I came back from this mission and I was completely exhausted and my blood pressure was high, I was dehydrated, and I'm not sure why, because I did all the protocols. Um, you know, I think, I tell people that over time, like I flew my four missions over a 10-year period, and I think the older you get, the older you as a person gets, the easier it is to go up into space, because you're going into zero gravity. But the older you get, the harder it is to come back to Earth, because now you're coming into a gravity field, your heart has to work harder just to stand up. I mean, just standing here right now, our heart is beating, you know, to keep the blood up to the head. And astronauts in the past have had a tendency to faint coming back, which is why we do a protocol of fluid loading. We drink salt water before home, which tastes terrible, but you do it because you don't want to faint, and you don't know if that's going to happen to you or not. So we, uh, anyway, I came back from this mission. I was completely exhausted. Um, our, we landed at, our families were out at Kennedy Space Center waiting for us, and we ended up going into Edwards. So we spent quite a bit of time out there doing medical exams, never went to sleep, got on the Gulf Stream 2 and flew back, and it was dark out, and we were supposed to have a welcome home ceremony canceled. Everybody went home, and we came out the next day in the daylight, and we did this uh, welcome home ceremony, and I was feeling a little bit better. My feet hurt, my back hurt, uh, my crew was doing better than me. <laughs> but we had uh, local people out there that came back to support us and the local media and the Houston mayor and, and whatnot. And it was really great to see uh, the people come and support us. And I knew it was my last mission, but it is kind of a shock for an astronaut to come back from a mission like that. And I can kind of empathize with how Apollo 11 felt coming back from their missions. All that training that you did on a high visibility mission and now it's over and what am I going to do? So, you know, I decided to retire and spend more time with my family and uh, turn over, well, there were, uh, at that point in time, there were 18 more flights on the manifest, and we had 50 astronauts that hadn't even flown one mission yet. It didn't make sense for me to fly again, and I thought the most important thing for our country is to get these rookies flown so we can have more people with the experience of having been to the space station. Yeah, so I think that's one of the, the, the great legacies and that we see also now with commercial spaces that there is more opportunity for more people to get a chance to experience this. To share, you know, those of you who remember uh, William Shatner's reactions when he came back from his uh, flight on, on Blue Origin and it was just totally, he, he was totally overcome with that over. I hope effect. I never recover from this. Yeah, yeah I hope, yeah. At, at 90 years old, but I mean, you need, we need people like that. We need people like all of us here who see the world in a very different way than people who are looking down at the ground every day. We look up in the sky, we see the Earth in a much different perspective than a lot of other folks do, and that's what astronauts flying in space can do for us. So say what you will about Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, they are giving an opportunity for people like us to eventually be able to go into space and see this for ourselves. Okay. So our final slide here, this is, you may have, have seen this woman before, but uh, we will be signing, we, we, we got together and wrote this book over uh, the course of COVID and uh, did it entirely virtually. And it's been a, been a great honor to be able to share the stage with Eileen. And, and, yeah, uh, and, and we're hoping this. that uh, young people read the book also. I know that space historians are gonna be interested in you know, what happened on the four missions that I flew, but we're also hoping that young people read the book. You know, I think, well, I know today, because I got two kids myself, they spend a lot of time on YouTube and TikTok and they're on Instagram a lot. And I don't think they really read books the way I did when I was a kid. And I think I encourage kids to read books. You know, part of the reason I wrote the book with Jonathan was to have something out there that's easy to read. High school person can read it, learn what it's like to be in the military, to work at NASA, uh, to have problems along the way. So we didn't want to, like, have an egotistical book. We wanted to put mistakes we made, problems we had, where we fell back how we recovered from it, both personally and on a mission level, and little techniques that we had along the way to help make the mission more successful, and really with a sense of humility. Okay.